Welcome, everyone. We are gathered here with a group of religious figures from around the world representing many faiths for a panel focused on how religious communities are practically taking action to curb climate change. I'm Rabbi Yonatan Nerol. I founded and direct the Interfaith Center for Sustainable Development. And we're going to start with Iman Sofet Katovic, who's from the Islamic Society of North America. Each speaker will speak for two minutes. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, greetings of peace. Your brother in faith and creation, Safed Abid Chadovic. I am the head of the Islamic Society of North America's Office for Interfaith Community Alliances and Government Relations in Washington, D.C. The Islamic Society of North America is the oldest and largest national Muslim umbrella organization. We just had our 59th annual convention in Chicago, Illinois this past Labor Day weekend. First time we've had a convention in person in three years uh, because of the COVID pandemic uh, restrictions and we pray God that he continues to lift this pandemic from all of uh, humanity. Um, ISNA's work and involvement with regard to greening practices and addressing climate change has a long history. Obviously, I have two minutes, so I can't talk in about all of it. You can check the website of ISNA, www.isnaisna.net, under the Green Initiatives tab for additional information. Our focus in ISNA and prior to ISNA in the mid-2000s of various grassroots green Muslim communities, that uh, green Muslim organizations and teams that sprung up in different parts of the country was to focus on ritual. There's someone by the name of Emil Durkheim, some of you might know him, the father of modern social sciences or sociology, religious sociology in particular, who said at one point, religion is ritual. And Muslims are blessed to have, and not like the other faith communities, the ritual of fasting. Um, and we have it for one month during the month of Ramadan. So Ramadan becomes a time and an opportunity for Muslims to engage in a large way with the community. And we took this opportunity to work in these various green Muslim uh, groups gra at the grassroots level to try to establish or reestablish prophetic practices with regard to care and with regard to walking softly upon the earth. Thank you. I've stopped. <laughs> we can talk more afterwards. God bless. Thank you, Imam Safet. I'm now pleased to welcome Valerian Bernard of Brahma Kumaris. Thank you, Jonathan. My pleasure and honor to be with all of you here. I would like to say that uh, from the beginning, the founder of the Brahma Kumaris has been emphasizing the importance of living simply and encouraging people to look at their inner world, their inner life, and see why is it they would want to consume so much. So encourage them to conquer desires and to be free from the influence of this outside world of consumerism. And then we have always looked at respecting and serving nature uh, by being vegetarian, and many of us are vegan now, and by using also the power of meditation to do a very beautiful thing we call serving the elements. We understand that human beings have been influencing nature in a very negative way through the desire to have more and more and more. So serving the elements is a bit like giving some peace and some love and helping to rebalance nature. But also in practicalities, we have tried to work. I mean, we've done a lot of research on solar systems. And we have given the technology that we have invented to other organizations sharing it because this is part of our principles. 
And one of the beautiful projects I really love is also sustainable yogic agriculture, where very simple people have actually started using all the power they gain through their own spiritual life with farming. And we also treat water because in India, Rajasthan, there's not much, so we've worked a lot on how to manage the recycling of water. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valerian. I'm now pleased to introduce Bishop Mark Andrus of the Episcopal Diocese of California. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, yesterday I shared a global project of the Anglican Communion of which we're a part that is called the Communion Forest. And uh, this past summer, some 650 Anglican bishops pledged that they would lead their diocese with presences in 195 countries in the world uh, into practices where it would link life transitions with planting trees. So births, uh, confirmations or um, services, marriages and, and funerals, that uh, those l human life cycles would be linked to the earth through the practice of, of tree planting. Uh, I, I also share that in the Episcopal Church, we've launched a carbon tracker, which allows people to measure their carbon footprint and then to take um, measures to right-size your carbon footprint. And that those um, actions aggregate up so that they can be used for advocacy. Uh, we can say, look how many of us have done this. Today, I'll mention that in the Diocese of California, which is the Episcopal Church in the Bay Area, we set a goal to put solar on all of our buildings. So we have 76 congregations and uh, some 20 institutions, and we've been able to achieve 50%. Um, the power of this is that uh, churches, mosques, synagogues, temples in their neighborhoods are are hugely influential. Your, your place of worship is noticed and loved by the people in the neighborhood. And when they see a solar array on your building, uh, they take note and it's encouraging to them. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Mark. I'm now pleased to introduce James Sternlich, CEO and founder of Peace Department. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so with the Peace Department, we're working on a few different tracks of interreligious cooperation and community building. So the first of those tracks is in supporting and fostering initiatives like the initiative that we're here representing today, uh, alongside our partners at Elijah Interfaith Institute and ICSD, we seek to help bring about a unified and clear message that no matter what religious tradition you follow, it is our obligation to take care of each other and to take care of the earth. And from that, uh, we have two different lines of work. One of those is building out infrastructure and uh, community activations, which will help us engage our communities further. We see uh, the opportunity for every house of worship to be a house of peace action and a house of climate action. And that means not only do we you know, go to church on Sundays or synagogue on Saturdays or, and go out there and you know, listen to the word, but we actually engage in the actions. So that means planting trees, cleaning up the streets, decarbonizing, all of these things. And the other line of work that we're working on is transboundary sustainable development projects. Our tagline for Peace Department is waging peace through sustainable development. And we firmly believe that that is the way. In the way that we do that is we look at a situation like the conflict uh, between Israel and Palestine, which is a something of a silly and tragic family feud at this point, I, the way I see it. And we say, what do people need? And when we look at what people need, people need water, they need power, they need food, they need a, a livelihood. And solving for that is a lot easier than solving the narratives sown by our fathers and forefathers uh, as to why we're fighting in the first place. So if we look around the world, we have a massive opportunity, whether it's looking at the conflicts between India and Pakistan, looking at Israel-Palestine, looking at the desolation that occurs in the Horn of Africa. 
there are opportunities for us to build across religious lines and across cultural lines and across national boundaries towards that better future that we all want and that we all hope for. And you know, hope is not a strategy, but the work is. Thank you. Thank you, James. I'm now pleased to introduce Reverend Susan Hendershot, President of Interfaith Power and Light. Thank you, Rabbi, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. So I'm gonna to touch on something just slightly different. Um, Interfaith Power and Light is my organization, and our mission is to inspire and mobilize people of faith and conscience to take bold and just action on climate change in the US. And we do this work through our national office and through our 40 state affiliates who are working at the grassroots level across the country. And it is a very coordinated effort to do this work together. And so what I want to touch on today is the advocacy work that we have done in the U.S. Um, the faith community in the U.S. was instrumental in passing the Inflation Reduction Act, which is, of course, the largest investment in climate funding um, in U.S. history. So we are very excited to be working with the administration and pushing on this through our advocacy and with having people of faith contacting their members of Congress so they are hearing from constituents across the country about why they care about climate from their sacred values. So this is a much different conversation than the business community can make and through many other organizations can make because we are working at the place of values. And additionally, because this was an election year in the US, we ran a faith climate justice voter campaign where we were actually asking voters to pledge to vote with climate in mind. And so we collected pledges from voters across the country. We actually created a values voter guide that we could distribute uh, to congregations and individuals across the country. And lastly, we just finished up text banking more than a half million voters in the states of Georgia, Pennsylvania, and Michigan asking them to vote their values on climate in this election. And we still have some work to do in Georgia with a runoff election, um, but we do this all as a 501c3, so it is a public education effort, and we're very proud of the results of our voter campaign this year in 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Hendershot. I'm pleased to introduce Nigel Savage, the founder and global ambassador for Chazon. Um, thank you, Rabbi Nerol. I'm incredibly honored to be here with everybody. Um, Chazon is the largest environmental organization in the Jewish community. I think that for all of us, fundamentally, there are two large questions. One is, what are our own faith communities actually doing? And secondly, what gifts, if at all, do we have for other communities around the world? In relationship to the Jewish community in the first question, I think of a great rabbi, Yitz Greenberg, who said of the different denominations within the Jewish community, I don't care what denomination you're from, so long as you're ashamed of it. And I say that, I say that in relation, in this case, to the Jewish people, because I want to say that on the one hand, I'm proud of strides that together we've taken in the last 20 years around education, action, and advocacy. We've started to integrate environmental education across the Jewish community. We've started to green Jewish institutions. We've started to speak up in public space. And yet all of that fundamentally is not enough. We in the last year have launched a Jewish climate leadership coalition with 20 of the largest organizations in the Jewish community and we've committed to developing together and publishing climate impact plans in the coming months and years, and that's important. In terms of lessons for other communities, I wanted simply to mention three things. First one is that the state of Israel is the only country in the world to end the 20th century with more trees than it began, because the Jewish National Front was committed to getting Jews all over the world to give money to plant trees. Every country in the world needs that today, and every faith community needs that. We all need to be planting trees. Secondly, the state of Israel, the fledgling state of Israel, was grown by Israel bonds, which were low-interest bonds that Jewish people around the world bought in order to support the state of Israel. 
Well, now we need climate bonds supported by faith communities and nonprofits and governments to drive systemic change around the world. And the last gift that I want to offer modestly from the Jewish people is the gift of hope. Part of famously the story of every Jewish holiday is they tried to kill us, we won, let's eat. And, <laughs> and, and the Jewish community has had a lot thrown at it over the last 20 centuries. And yet fundamentally we believe in striving to strengthen every single community of which we are part with a sense of hope and determination. That is the role that I believe that all faith communities can and should be playing in the world in the coming years and decades. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. I'm pleased to introduce Bishop Andreas Holmberg of the Stockholm Diocese of the Church of Sweden. Thank you, Rabbi. Yes, I'm Bishop Andreas. The Church of Sweden is the largest church in Sweden. We gather a bit more than half the population of Sweden, 5.5 million. And I think let's first take note of what's happening here. I think that's an important message in itself that leaders of faith and the faith traditions stand united in our concern for nature as a whole and in our love for nature. There's no division between us. We are all behind this. And that's why we're here, for, to express our concern and our prayers for the ongoing deliberations at, the, at this uh, convention. So Church of Sweden, two examples of what we do in practical terms. We have decided and, um, that we will be climate neutral as a whole, as a whole organization by 2030, which is just eight years away. That means we're looking at changing uh, the way we heat our churches and other buildings, our transport, our cars, our diggers at the graveyards, etc. We're putting up solar cells, replacing um, oil-based or coal-based solutions with batteries, etc. Uh, secondly, we have set up a mechanism since a few years back where parishes, the local churches, can enter into a certification process, a climate and sustainability certification in, at three different levels. And in my own diocese, the Diocese of Stockholm, up to now about 60% of the parishes are doing that at the first, second or third phase. So that's a powerful structure in itself. And thirdly, we are starting to explore in our church uh, ways to give people chance to express their grief liturgically in sermons through symbols to express their grief, their anger, and also their guilt. Because in our part of the world, there's a lot of common guilt that is finding it difficult to find expressions. So in our liturgies, we're trying to explore ways to, to, to have people have space to express their grief, their sorrow, their guilt, and their anger in order to get new uh, power and initiative to go move forward. So those would be a few examples. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Holmberg. I'm now pleased to introduce Dr. Fakhruddin Majiri Mangunjaya, who's chairman of the Center for Islamic Studies at the National University of Jakarta. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nariel. Rabbi, in 2015, there was burning forests in Indonesia. At the weeks, uh, several weeks of the burning, the emission was equal to one year Germany emission. He was very sad at that time. And we asked the ulama, what they can do for stopping the regularity of burning uh, land and the forest because of the it's caused the climate emission as Indonesia regularly have 80 percent of its emission is coming from the burning of the forest and also the land conversion. In 2016, there's a patwa was released. Patwa number 30, 2016. After that, with massive training with the local clerics, we have trained 100. Our university is participating together with the collective action with the government. 
we, I think, successfully to stop together the habitual burning land of the forest in some way also by helping the enforcement by the government. But over there, the Islamic Council of Ulama, MUI, have taken their role in changing the behavior and also the changing of heart of and mind of the people of Indonesia in that Muslim population, population the most populated Muslim uh, country in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fakhrudin. Our last speaker is Father Eduardo Agosto of the Laudato Si movement, formerly the Global Catholic Climate Movement. Thank you, Jonathan, for this kind invitation. I'm a Carmelite friar and a Catholic priest and Argentinian, so you will, I will tie my speech to my script because my English is not so fluent. As a member of the Catholic Roman Church, I research in the field of atmospheric and climate dynamics, looking for understanding climate variability and change and how they impact globally. I also dive into the relationship between science, faith, and integral ecology advocacy within the Laudato Si movement and the Vatican Dicastery for promoting integral human development. Overall, we find that there is a need to deploy a prophetic stance before the signs of the times today, connected with the signs of the place, the earth, our common home, so that our faith communities can make their voices heard upon the existential decisions of our times. These decisions are complex and wrapped up in national and global politics as we are witnesses here of the issue. Still, we step out in faith to learn from the suffering of peoples and nature and challenge injustice in a united prophetic voice together with other faiths as we are gathered here today as we continue on our own ecological conversion journeys. Our prophetic advocacy is a humble one that is rooted in the fact that we share the same creation with every living thing. If everything is connected and at an individual level, we all need to go through a radical integral ecological and a spiritual conversion that turns what is happening in the world into our own personal suffering as Pope Francis indicates in Laudato Si encyclical number 19 and seek to resolve it. Based on sound science and the social teaching of the Catholic Church, the message here today is clear. One, mitigation includes unfailingly considering divestment and the rapid and gradual abandonment of fossil fuels against carbon market domination and just transition. That is why in June of 2020, the Vatican issued guidelines for the Catholic Church communities that include divestment from fossil fuels and other things. The development of an alternative energies and financing for the just transition of the countries that are most in need is imperative. The encyclical states, okay. we know that technology based so, so, on the issue, on the use so of highly polluting it's, fossil it's fuels. Two minutes, so if you could I will wrap finish up. just in a okay. while, yeah. Needs to be progressively replaced without delay. And to finish, on a personal level, we are called to continue supporting the integral ecology conversion through changes in our lifestyles that that is not yet discussed in our politics. As in our patterns of production and consumption that are more in line to a decarbonized economy in which less is more. In fact, we need to learn to consume less. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Father Eduardo. So we have about six minutes left and I'd like to ask we know that this movement is punching above its weight, but at the same time is relatively underfunded. If you could double your budget in 30 seconds, maximum 45 seconds, what's one thing that you would do to help humanity curb climate change to mobilize faith communities if you could double your budget? Imam, Safit. Continue the work that ISNA has done with regard to 
pushing fossil fuel divestment, being the national, first national Muslim organization to do so, and secondly, to have everybody sign up to support the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, we need a treaty. We need enforcement mechanisms to make sure we keep it in the ground. Thank you. We need people to become aware. We have the two living systems. One is the one of awareness and conscience, and the other is the nat natural system. And the more the awareness of people will rise in the finance, in the business, in the governments, the better decisions will be taken for our Mother Earth, both in lifestyle changes at home with every human being, as well as on the global level. There are literally millions of people of faith who are working on the ground doing astounding things, and most of us don't know anything about it. I would uh, establish a magazine uh, that, uh, called The Earth Witness, I have a name for it, that would gather the stories of people of faith doing climate change and environmental work all over the world and push it out so that people can, can get the ideas and the hope that they need. Just double might be a bit limiting, but um, <laughs> the definitely the storytelling is a huge part of it, and also what we look to do with Peace Department and, and with this you know coalition is to lead by example. So to really bring to light and bring about those projects that can demonstrate to humanity that the pro we have the solutions to our problems. We just need to get have faith that if we do the work, the good things will happen. Excellent question. Thank you for posing it to us. Um, so inter the, what Interfaith Power and Light is very good at is reaching people in communities where they are. So if we were to double our investment, we would double down on investing in those communities and reaching people where they are. So that would be a huge investment in our state affiliates across the country, hiring more organizers, reaching more communities, and really, really doubling down on our, um, just our thorough commitment to environmental and climate justice um, in communities across the United States. So that's what we would do with double our budget. <laughs> President, oops. President Obama famously said, we are the first generation to experience the consequences of climate change and the last that can do something about it. Jewish tradition famously teaches, which is more important, learning or doing? Learning because it leads to doing. And I think if I could do one thing, it would be to take key leaders across and beyond the Jewish community, leaders of Jewish organizations, businesses, senior elected officials, and have them learn intensely about what is going wrong in the world, the changes that are coming down the pike, and the things that we could or should be doing. And I really believe that that kind of learning at that level can and should lead to action sooner rather than later. Well, Church of Sweden doesn't, Church of Sweden doesn't need more money, so if we could double our budget, we would immediately transfer that money to are millions and millions of sisters and brothers in less fortunate countries that are suffering as we speak from, from climate catastroph catastroph catastrophes of different kinds in Nigeria, in Pakistan, in the Philippines, just to mention a few current examples. Thank you. Thank you very much. If we can double the budget, and the first important thing is to trans transform the knowledge of climate change to the clerics, to the grassroots communities, through the um, sermon, through education, as the youth is also very important. And the institutions, religious institutions, such as mosques, we have 800,000 mosques, and we need the to enlighten about the bridging on science and religious for the 
changing behavior of mind of the people. If we double our budget, uh, first of all, we have to finance loss and damage of climate injustice that are many people on the, in the South, global south are suffering already. Also, um, financing the just transition into alternative energies because the, the end of fossil fuels must be done and to support the non-proliferation fossil fuels treaty. Thank you so much for the, our esteemed panelists. And we welcome your engaging with us in the future to help to grow the religion and ecology movement and to enable the next generation to inherit a thriving, sustainable, and spiritually aware planet. Thank you very much.